In this presentation, in seven steps, you will learn how to spot a fault in an electronic board even if you don't have any schematic. So you have a faulty board and uh, you know nothing about it. Give up. You can't do it. <laughs> okay, I'm joking. But of course you need some information so you have to gather some information about the, the, the board and uh, what it does. Uh, but first a little disclaimer. I'm not a repair guy, except being an entrepreneur, a CEO, and uh, had some other rules in the past. Uh, I've been used to be into the research and development and, and not in servicing or repairs, almost uh, not directly. <laughs> so my approach is, how to say, more scientific, but for sure I won't suggest you bullshits like uh, removing and replacing all the electrolytic capacitors on the board, as it seems many people think it's kind of magic bullet. No, no, no. These capacitors are still in good shape uh, in spite they have uh, more than 20 years. Made in Japan, made in Italy. So let's get started with the first step. So in this presentation the precondition is that you don't have access uh, to any schematic. Even though this is not usual uh, in a professional environment where you usually have access to uh, schematics and service manuals. And um, I remember uh, when I was a young technician back in the 80s, it was really hard to get information. But at the time equipment were usually shipped with uh, schematics. Uh, uh, that is no longer the case, unfortunately, and uh, it could be a topic for another video. Uh, but uh, nowadays we have the internet, so go and Google. Uh, an experienced repairman co could also uh, estimate, or better guess, estimate uh, where the fault could be. Uh, but uh, uh, you never know exactly how and why the board were faulty and uh, and uh, and that is a bad approach because uh, you you don't know if you have really resolved the problem so the first step is try to get an idea of what the board is supposed to do and why it doesn't do that and this and this can be done gathering information you need to know how the board is meant to work its power supply and the expected outputs in relation with inputs. And people feel that, that uh, brought the board to you uh, can provide the uh, useful information. For example, here it says that uh, the board is broken and the PC is receiving nothing, or more or less. My German uh, is pretty rusty. I've studied German at the elementary school, but I forgot everything. <laughs> and um, and uh, sometimes it is not that useful because here it says that uh, it is the, the board is broken. Well, it is broken, actually. This has the poor person catch microscopic uh, problems, uh, uh, like, uh, let's say, a chip that is jammed in, on the board and uh, caused a short. Uh, that could be a clue of what originated the, the failure and maybe it would help uh, to narrow down the area uh, to look for and uh, maybe uh, to reverse engineer too. But if you see a burnt uh, board, you reach the end of your repair because a burnt board is beyond repair. This is a burnt board, it is clearly beyond repair. 12 mega, 13 mega. Step number three, set up a testing environment. You need a power supply, uh, you need a, a load and or uh, some indicating lights. Uh, you need uh, some potentiometer maybe to provide uh, control signals and uh, maybe even a function generator to provide signals to the board under test. And of course you need instrumentation. but. For most of the repairs, uh, you don't need something fa uh, fancy instruments. Uh, you just need uh, an oscilloscope, and even a 20 megahertz uh, to trace this oscilloscope. An old oscilloscope is good enough in most, uh, in many situations. Uh, a good uh, uh, multimeter, maybe an amperometer could be good uh, to have. Um, 
and a function generator and uh, a bunch of potentiometers, uh, switches, uh, indicating lights, uh, you know, something to recreate the environment uh, in which the board had to live uh, to uh, reproduce uh, its, uh, its uh, functionalities, its, its working environment. This is one of the most important points because uh, power is uh, where the, the most of the electronic boards and uh, electronic circuits uh, fail. Uh, so uh, after giving the power to your board under test, uh, the first thing to do is to test uh, the power rails uh, to check if they are within the range and check with the oscilloscope because uh, sometimes uh, uh, you measure the voltage with a multimeter but it could mask uh, uh, oscillations uh, and noise uh, that could cause faults in the board. So that's an important step, check the power. Because you don't have the schematic, you have to follow from the output toward back, backward toward the inputs uh, uh, the signal following the traces on the board, uh, on the circuit board. Starting from the output that doesn't work, uh, we go backward uh, into the circuit uh, and, uh, and we try to follow the path and trace uh, what we meet, uh, the components we meet, and then and this and this will be useful then when when we check uh, the voltages to see if the voltages are consistent with the components we found. Uh, you need to uh, keep note uh, of the uh, path you are uh, following, uh, recreating sort of uh, schematic, because a schematic is like a map, it helps you to orientate in the circuit and uh, it helps you to understand what is going on, uh, because while you are following the path you pick up the measurements of the voltages and uh, keep note of that voltages in the schematic that you are reconstructing following the path. Each component must behave uh, consistently with the voltages that has in its surrounding. And each component you meet along the path, it tells you if it's working properly given the surrounding conditions. Let's say, for example, you meet a transistor and you see a transistor that has um, some voltage in its base but you see a large voltage between its uh, collector and meter. Clearly that transistor is not working properly. Something is going wrong there. If you find a capacitor that uh, is supposed to have some voltage because it is uh, uh, powered through a resistor but you find uh, uh, but you find zero volt, well, that capacitor is faulty and you have to change that capacitor. Maybe it's an electrolytic capacitor. Oh gosh. So for example, this, wall, this board uh, is uh, designed to control a motor and, um, and the guy that got me this uh, to, to check because it, the motor uh, was not working properly. He gave me this and uh, gave me the the wiring. Uh, I'm not even sure that the wiring he gave me are correct uh, but I've been able to to make the, this to work uh, somewhat to work uh, for testing purposes. I've taken the picture of the um, solder side and uh, overlapped it uh, so uh, to the, um, the picture of the component side now, following the path I've been uh, <laughs> and the traces of the PCB, uh, I've been able to uh, reconstruct this circuit uh, and um, a, a little bit of explanation of how it works. Um, this is, uh, of course, uh, just a, a part, a section of the full circuit. So here we have the uh, input of the power uh, that comes from the mains, uh, 230 volt, and we have two fuses here, protection varistor here, and two diodes uh, provides a direct voltage uh, through this um, header. Here this is a, a filter, here we have this first uh, thyristor that uh, provides a, 
a flow of current uh, through this resistor which is uh, just uh, 0.1 ohm and that goes out uh, through this uh, screw terminal and uh, and then goes to the motor and uh, its uh, excitation and then back uh, through this diode to the other phase and uh, and when the, the the phase reverses uh, we have the exact opposite uh, so we have the current that flow through this uh, uh, thyristor again through the motor and back through this diode and uh, and this diode is just to protect uh, against uh, reverse voltage and uh, and here we have this snapper and uh, the two thyristors uh, are driven uh, through these two resistors that is in turn and are um, fed through this uh, unijunction that is a null component that uh, is really um, hard to find nowadays and uh, the problem here was that the motor was vibrating um, so and never reached maximum power um, so one possible uh, problem would be that one of these two thyristors was broken or maybe one of these diodes, uh, these two diodes. Now you have seen the schematic, try to guess what was the component broken. However, the diodes were okay and um, but this thyristor never to know and uh, so I, I looked uh, at this point uh, this point of course is connected through this uh, resistor to this other um, thyristor that was working so because here we have a voltage and here we, we would expect to have a voltage again and the thyristor would turn on in that conditions but here we didn't have the voltage so the thyristor was good but the problem was here this was the culprit so the resistor was actually interrupted and uh, and uh, was necessary to replace the resistor and uh, the circuit went to uh, work again to summarize, gather information from people on field and on, from the internet. Do a visual inspection to check for microscopic faults. Three, set up a proper testing environment to reproduce the fault in laboratory condition. Four, check for the power supply and the rail of the power supply of the board. Five, follow the path uh, to reproduce uh, the schematic, the relevant part uh, of the schematic that uh, is in, of interest uh, about the fault that you are searching for. And uh, six, uh, check for consistency. Voltages and the currents uh, must be consistent with the components uh, that are using them. And finally, a bonus point, uh, intermittent faults. This is kind of nightmare for <laughs> those who have to find a fault because you have the board you put the board under test and the board work, works uh, what's going on some faults happens under certain conditions so you have to reproduce that conditions uh, apply vibrations uh, apply a variation in temperature and uh, check if the board still works usually uh, intermittent faults uh, are related to temperature or vibrations it is rarely caused by other uh, reasons. Uh, I hope the content of this video was uh, interesting for you. If so, consider to subscribe and hit the like button. It is free and uh, it will really help uh, the channel to grow. Also, uh, in my website uh, at accidentalscience.com you will find uh, more uh, complementary information about the video I publish on YouTube. That's all folks for today, thanks for watching, see you next time, bye!